Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. We gather today to celebrate the greatest victory in human history, and I grew up in a generation at a time when kind of victory and winning and losing were kind of part of life as a kid. I played sports, and when I played sports, you, there'd be winners and there'd losers, and that was okay. If you, you lost a baseball game, you know, you'd go over and you'd get some of the snack shack afterwards, and you'd cheer yourself up, but you, you moved on with it. Like, I lived, grew up in a world where competition was, was seen as a good thing. As a matter of fact, I, I loved that kind of stuff so much. I got into, to like, I really loved you know, like, you know, karate and kung fu and martial arts, and, and I watched all these martial arts movies and, and TV shows. Anybody remember those? And matter of fact, I was into it so much, I made my own nunchucks. Some of you don't even know what nunchucks are. They're probably illegal now, but uh, I made my own nunchucks. Great way to get a dent, dent in your forehead. But, uh, and, and my parents captured a, a short snapshot of video of me as a kid with nunchucks. You want to see that? Yeah. It's pretty, it's, 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 it was pretty good. Take a look at this. Okay, that's how I imagined myself. <laughs> That wasn't me, but, but I imagine my, no, it's true, that wasn't me, uh, but, but that, that's the world I grew up in. As a kid, I grew up in that world. Then, when I had kids, I entered a different world. I didn't know, I, I didn't know the world had changed until I went to the first meeting of the parents and coaches for AYSO, American Youth Soccer Organization. And I went to the first meeting the head of the group explained how soccer works. Now, I'd played soccer for years, competitively. And he explained, we don't keep score. And there aren't points. And there's no winners or losers. They, the kids just go out and run around and have fun. As a matter of fact, this is one of my first teams that I coached. This, two of my boys are up there in that group. And, and, and so you know, I'm, I'm taught that I'm supposed to explain to them that we don't keep score and we don't do points. And, but, I was, but remember, I grew up in this world. I grew up with nunchucks and competition and winners and losers, and now I'm being told I'm living in a different world where we don't do those sorts of things. So I don't know, I don't know how you coach soccer with there's no points. Or if there's no, so I actually, so I just kind of in my own sweet and innocent way, as I do, um, I just said, um, I just asked Ray, I said, um, can we tell them what direction to kick the ball? Is that fair? You know, if, if there's no, I said, can we tell them like which our team's going that way? And he said, well, of course you can do that. And I said, well, could, you know, could I, can we tell them? You know, I said, There's, is there going to be goals? They said, well, yeah, there'll be goals. It's soccer. And I said, okay, well, I said, can we tell the kids to, you know, kick the ball, what? Into the goal. And he said, well, of course. I said, what if they ask me why? <laughs> you see the dilemma? <laughs> is that you following me? I said, what if, they say, what, if the, what if the kids say, why do we kick it in the goal? I said, can I tell them that we get a point? He said, well, sure. I said, well, then, anyways, uh, <laughs> I grew up in this world, <laughs> and now I'm dropped, I'm dropped into this world, and wh whether, you, whether you come from this world or this world, when it comes to God, there's a victory. Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, was victorious over sin, death, 
guilt, shame, judgment, hell, Satan, the grave, death, and I could go on. As a matter of fact, I'm preaching. I will. Uh, he, Jesus was victorious. He won the battle. And that's got to, you know, whatever world we come from, that's got to fit into our worldview. It's got to fit, fit into our understanding of the biblical story. I want to share today one eternity transforming miracle, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The God who came, the God who lived, the God who loved, the God who died for all of our wrongs, rose again in victory. Someone say amen. amen. He rose again. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 15. As a matter of fact, if you have your Bible or a Bible app or a phone and you want to open up to a passage for today, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15 a couple different times. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning of verse 3, says this. The Apostle Paul says, For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, for all of our wrongs, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. But not only that, there were witnesses to this. And then he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12 and after that he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living so some have fallen asleep, some have died. So you can go and ask them. They, they experienced seeing the resurrected Jesus Christ. They're still alive. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared also to me, Paul says, as to one abnormally born. We are talking today about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not as a metaphor, not as a, a spiritual concept, but as a historical reality. And I'm, what I'm not going to try to do today is kind of walk through all the historical evidence for the resurrection, but I would encourage you, if that's interesting to you, and if you're trying to still sort out the whole Jesus thing, you can just Google this. Explore God, and then this question, did the resurrection happen? Great article. I looked over it this morning, actually. Explore God, did the resurrection happen? And you'll find an amazing article by a scholar who spent about 40 years studying this. What I want to talk about today is a miraculous message, the message of the resurrection. I don't want to debate whether or not it happened. I believe with all my heart it did. I hope you believe that too. If you don't, I hope one day you embrace that reality. But here's the message. God has broken the power of sin. He's crushed death and beaten the enemy of our souls. And through the resurrection of Jesus, we are offered freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from judgment, freedom from hell, and freedom from the power of the enemy. That's what God offers through his resurrection. This is good news. This is life-changing reality. And listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 15, 52 to 54, talking about the implications of the resurrection of Jesus for us if we believe in him and place our faith in him. For those who've come to know Jesus, he says this, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. His resurrection offers us resurrection and hope for eternity. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. The mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That's good news. That's the victory of Jesus. And that's the victory he offers to you and me. So I just want to spend a few moments today thinking about what I call mind-staggering implications. If we understand the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it will, it will stretch our minds. It will, it will, just, it will cause us to, to be in wonder and in awe. And today I want to focus on just the, the mind-staggering reality of the resurrection and the implications for our lives. So here's the first implication. Death and the grave do not have the final voice or say. Death and the grave don't win. They don't get the final word. There's more than just this life that ends in death. The resurrection of Jesus Christ assures us of this. When I was in third grade, I grew up in a home uh, with no faith, no Bible, no church, just, just zero, nothing. And uh, my, what I was kind of led to believe by the time I was in third grade was simply this. When your life ends, it's like somebody just takes a light switch and just goes, click, Lights off, and then it goes dark, it's over. There's nothing else. And in third grade, one of my closest friends named David got something called leukemia. It took his body very quickly, it ravaged him, and within a few weeks, he passed away. And I remember sitting with my dad on the edge of his bed 
I was in tears. I was in third grade, and, and again, I was raised to not have any framework for anything beyond this life. And I, I said to my dad, Dad, um, where's David? Where's David now? And he didn't really understand what I was asking because he just said to me, well, you know that David died. I, I said, I know, but where's David? Where is he now? I was asking a deeply personal existential question that any third grader would ask if they lose a close friend. Is there more than this? Is there a life beyond this life? Is there something eternal, something spiritual? And this is how my dad responded. My dad, a very, very bright man. He said these words, I don't know. And in my mind, I thought, well, if my dad doesn't know, I guess nobody can know. And I stayed in that frame of thinking until I met the resurrected Jesus Christ and realized that there's more than what this life has to offer. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 and 56, we're told this. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has overcome. When Jesus came into this world, it was God, Emmanuel, that's Christmas, Emmanuel, God, coming among us. God born among us. He lived a life with no wrong and no sin. But he was nailed to a cross. And on that cross, he took our wrongs and our sin and our punishment and our pain and our shame. He took it all on himself. On that cross, he said, it's finished. And he died in our place for our wrongs. And three days later, he rose again in glory. Death and sin do not have the final voice. And that, that, that is staggering for our thinking, especially if you grew up like I did. Here's a second mind-staggering implication of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Satan and sin have lost their control over me. Because Christ is risen, because he's present and powerful, Satan and sin are still around. Satan will still try to entice us and sin will still try to lure us in. But they don't have control over us. They're not in charge. God's in charge. And if the resurrected Jesus lives in you, you can walk in that resurrection power. And you, you can lean on his strength and lean on his power to say no to the enemy, to the tempter, and to say yes to Jesus. In the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, in the 10th verse, Jesus is speaking. And he puts this in perspective. He says, the thief, that's Satan, that's the enemy of our soul. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's, that's Satan's mission statement, to steal, to kill, to destroy. Listen to what Jesus says. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, overflowing life. He doesn't say life's always perfect. He doesn't say there's never struggles. But he says, I will give you an overflowing, abundant life. That's what the resurrection offers to us if we'll receive it. Mind-staggering implication. Here's the third one. I love this. Shame, guilt, and fear are crushed under the feet of the risen Savior. Jesus wins. He's victorious. In my mind, from my childhood, Jesus comes to shame, guilt, and fear. Numbchuck, bam, bam, bam. They're laying in the dust, man. I mean, they're, they're down. They're out. And you know who's won. In his resurrection, he overcame shame and guilt and fear. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, we read this. There's no fear in love. And remember, God is love. God is perfect love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. If we understand what Jesus did on the cross, when he hung on the cross, he took our punishment. He took our shame. He took our place. He offered himself for us as, as the substitution for all of our wrongs. And he said, it's finished. It's paid. And all of our sins went to the grave with him and they're not coming out of there. And if we receive this Jesus and what he did on the cross, Shame and guilt and fear, it's all gone. And you say, but man, I still live with a lot of that. Bring it to Jesus. And he'll tell you, I, I've dealt with it. That's where I died. That's where I gave my life. And then in the place of those things can come confidence and peace and a calm spirit because you know who you belong to and you know what Jesus has done. Mind-staggering implications. Here's another one. No matter what I face today or tomorrow, God has my eternity secure in his hands. Whatever I face, whatever I come against, I can know that in this lifetime, there may be tough things, but my security for eternity is locked in the heart of Jesus, and it's been won by the resurrected Jesus Christ. 
And, and so I understand that though this life may have difficult times and pain, that God has my future secure. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 to 44. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It will be raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. This is not the end of the story. Early this morning, I was actually praying through and kind of going through my sermon for today. And my phone rang. There was a leader in our church. And he said, have you picked up any news yet today? I said, no, I haven't. He said, I need to share what's been going on in Sri Lanka. Over eight bombings in churches and in hotels. And, and uh, over 200 people so far that, they, that have been killed and 400 to 500 people injured. On Easter in Sri Lanka, people put bombs in places where people would be gathering for worship or preparing to go to worship. And as I heard that news, I just stopped my sermon stuff and I had a prayer over the phone with this person who called me. And I was so struck by a number of realities. You know, one was we just prayed for, um, for these people who had lost loved ones that are going through this and just in the middle of all of this. Many of them get up with their family to go to church on Easter Sunday and have their, the building blow up. I was also struck by the reality that those who have faith in Jesus Christ who died this Easter went directly into the arms of Jesus because this life is not the end and God has more planned. And I wanna just pause for a minute here and if you'll join me just in praying. Lord Jesus, we pray for these people in Sri Lanka who right now, some of them are trying to find family members, some of them are, are in hospitals, hundreds of people who've been injured, um, Many of these are people who love you, who believe in you, put their faith in you. And Lord, will you be with them and give them your comfort and your strength as they begin to piece their bodies and their lives back together again. But in the midst of this prayer, for those who had faith in you, who'd come to the cross and receive you, Jesus, we believe because of the resurrection of Jesus that they now are with you. And we thank you for the hope of the resurrection in the midst of one of the most horrific moments in the history of that nation. Lord, you bring hope because of your resurrection. Surround those people with your love and your care. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I also took time this morning to write an email to a good friend of mine who's a pastor in Colombo where this happened, and then Pastor Walt sent some notes to our partners. We partner in Sri Lanka in training people and, and leaders there, and so continue praying for them and lifting them up. Mind-staggering implications. I want to share two more with you. I am never alone because the risen Savior will be my closest friend. Because he's risen, you never have to be alone again, and you never have to be lonely. Because you can always walk in the presence of Jesus. I love these words from John chapter 15. Jesus is teaching, and he's talking about himself and us. And he says, my command is this. Love each other, Jesus says, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. He's talking about himself and what he's going to do for us. Your greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then Jesus says this, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have also made known to you. I love this. Jesus says, I am not some aloof first mover, some creator off in space that kind of got things going and, and says, okay, enjoy yourselves. God says, I will be the closest friend you could ever have. Because he's risen, because he's alive, he wants that kind of a relationship with us. And by putting our faith in him, we can walk in that relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not religion, it's a relationship walking with Jesus Christ. He offers that because of his resurrection. And one last mind-staggering implication. When this life ends... A better life begins. We cling to this life. I don't know if any of you noticed that during the video on the giving back time, that was all our neighborhood here. That was all those images, those, sky, those drone shots that somebody in our congregation here made that video for us. And it's all the area. It's beautiful and staggering and stunning. There's so much in this world that's beautiful and so many things to be enjoyed. But as good as the best day in this life is, it pales in comparison infinitely to one moment in the presence of God when this life ends. 
If we've come to God through faith in Jesus and we go to be with him forever, it's beyond our wildest imaginations. This last Friday, I had a really good Friday. Uh, it was Good Friday. And we had two services here. I had a great Friday. I got up in the morning and spent some time with my wife, which I love. I love my wife. I'm crazy about her. I worked at my home office a little bit. I actually like working. I did a little bit of work at my home office. I came in here and with many of you gathered and we had communion and worship together. It was incredible. Then I, then I went home and I had to be before the seven o'clock service. And I had a couple hours. I didn't have it planned, but I thought, you know, I'm gonna go out and play like six or seven holes of golf. And I went, I went and played, I just went by myself, played, played for like an hour. And, it was, and I had some good shots. It was really fun. I had a great time. And I sometimes, I mean, with lots of people, sometimes I like being just with me. So I went out alone. I just had a great time golfing. Came back here, led another worship service and, and shared with God's people in worship. And then spent the evening with my wife and connected with some family members. It was, it was an amazing, incredible day. Some days, there's hard days, but some days are just great days. But I look at that day and I realize that to be with Jesus one day will be infinitely more glorious. And that was a really good day. There's more ahead. And because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can live in that and hold to that. Jesus said this in John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house, Jesus, this is a picture. My father's house, Jesus says, has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Jesus says, I'm preparing a place for you. The implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ are staggering and mind-blowing. And I hope this Easter season, you just drink that in. If you know Jesus, if you've come to him and received him as the leader of your life and confessed your sins to him, know that those things are true for you. And if you don't yet know Jesus, open your heart. If you embrace him, he says, this is, this is the life I offer for you and the eternal life I have prepared for you. And he offers it to all who will believe. So here's my final word. I call it a massive challenge. Will I accept this risen Savior? If you've never said yes to Jesus, you might know about him, but you've never said, I receive you as the leader of my life. I give my wrongs, my sins to you. Forgive me. If you've never done that, I challenge you to do that today. And if you know him, this is for you. To ask, how will I walk and live in this resurrection power, in this reality of the resurrection? How will I stand against the final and flailing enticements of the enemy of my soul? To say, I can hold on to him. I can live for him. I can follow him every moment of every day. The Apostle Paul says these words in Romans chapter 10. He says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. I don't know if you come from the, the world I did with competition and winning and losing and victories and, and that was kind of the way things were or if you come from the let's not keep score and let's, you know, I don't know which world you come from but I know this. This day, Easter Sunday, is about a victory that Jesus Christ won. He conquered sin and hell and death and guilt and fear and shame and loneliness and Satan and hell. And he offers that victory to us. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, for many gathered today in this room and in the family worship venue and in the overflow space and, and online, following the service online, for many people today, they would say, I believe in Jesus. I put my faith in him. I've received his forgiveness and his grace. Lord, for those people, I pray that they would in a fresh new way celebrate the glory of the resurrection. And be amazed at all that has come to them because of your resurrection and all that lies ahead. Lord, we celebrate you and thank you, Jesus, for leaving the glory of heaven, coming to this earth, living a perfect life, dying in our place for all of our wrongs, and rising again in glory. We give you praise. And if you're here today, or online today, and you say, I, I never really understood, I, I never really came to that place, where I cried out to Jesus. You can do it right now. You can just tell him in your heart. You can just tell him, say, Jesus, I didn't know until now, but I, I get it. I understand. 
that you are God who came among us, that you laid your life down for me, for my wrongs. You took my punishment and my shame on yourself on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. I release my wrongs, my sins. I just give them all to you. I, just, I lay them at the foot of your cross. I confess them to you. And I say, Jesus, forgive me and cleanse me. And I say, Jesus, take my hand and lead me and guide me all for this life and for eternity. Jesus, thank you for being here among us, for being raised from the dead.